We do have uh, the time now for Andy's dad, Ted. Uh, service will be Thursday at 1130 at Greenwood. So we want to let you know about that. Thursday, 1130 at Greenwood. Isn't it great to be together this morning? I am, I'm going to be honest with you. I have been looking forward to this since last Sunday night. And I mean that with all sincerity. I, I always enjoy when I have the opportunity to uh, be together with my brethren, and, and it's exciting. I know that there's some, th some special things going on today. Um, there's a couple of, by the name of Kirshner, they've been married a long time, had benchmark birthdays this past month or two, and they're here today with their family, and we're going to honor them immediately following our worship this morning. If you want to, go by and say hello to them. They're going to be just inside the fellowship area, and, and uh, we're glad that they're here. Thank you all for being here. It's good to see Fred back. He, he tried to have a fight with the floor, something like that, but we're glad that he's here, glad that he's doing better. It's always good to see you guys. I love you. I really do. I love this church, and I love everything about it. We're, we're a congregation for those who are visiting that are striving to be what God wants us to be, and I'm excited that we're sharing the vision in 2016 in a way that we might not have ever done before, and I hope that you're getting it. I hope that you're realizing it through our study, and as we, we go through the book of Acts this week and, 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 and for the last several weeks, and, and to study this and to look at it today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, and, and I'm excited about that because I, I've entitled the lesson today, I Am Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, in, in verse 5 especially, because I believe that it's important for us to understand, as, as uh, CR read to us just a few moments ago, Whenever he asked, when Saul asked, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. I am the one that you're persecuting. And I think it's important that we know that. Let me tell you why I think it's important to know that. Here several years ago, I'll never forget the day that Tim and I were uh, at the airport to pick up Lisa and Tony from a trip to Washington, D.C., I was excited about it because they'd been gone for several days and none of our family had ever been to Washington, D.C. So I wanted to hear all the stories and, and to hear all the events. And, and Tim and I had had like three days together and he was getting tired of me and, and I, was, I was enjoying it. And, uh, you know, as most fathers do when the kids get tired of you. But we spent Saturday together and we did everything in the world. We played putt-putt. We went and saw a movie. I even let Tim pick out where we went to eat dinner that night. And that was risky. It could have been McDonald's or it could have been a steak at the big steakhouse downtown in San Antonio called the Ryan. I said, anywhere you want to go. Just anywhere you want to go. And uh, we went to a Mexican food place, which was really good because he liked that. It was, it was not as expensive. But I told him, I said, we'll, we'll buy whatever you want to buy. And he didn't take too big of advantage of me. But as we sat there, we went to the, uh, we arrived, uh, the flight was going to come in at 1030 and we arrived about an hour early, and we were sitting in the waiting area. And as we sat in the waiting area in the San Antonio airport, one of the things that we like to do is to you know, people watch. You know what I mean? Everybody usually is looking at me when I walk in until I sit down and I start looking at everybody else. But whenever we go through there, you know, we, I love to people watch. And as I was doing that, this man walked in, and he was tall. He was probably the tallest man that Tim had ever seen in his life. He said, Dad, who is that? Who is that? And I said, well, son, that's one of my favorite basketball players ever. He said, what's his name? I said, he is known as the Iceman. His name is George Gervin. He played power forward for the San Antonio Spurs. He was a basketball hero of mine. I wanted to grow up and be just like him. I was already an adult, I think, whenever he was playing. But, you know. but Tim looked at him and went, wow, that's George Gervin, and, he, and, and George heard him. There's another story about my oldest son, Jeff, who an athlete heard what he said about him, and, and we'll tell you that story some other time. But, uh, but, but, but George was a great guy. He heard Tim say, 
wow, that's George Gervin. And he put a great big old smile on his face just like that. And he walked over and he stuck out his hand. He says, hello, young man, I'm George Gervin. And Tim stuck his hand out and said, I'm Tim Farmer. He said, well, I'm glad to meet you. He made Tim feel like he was somebody. Sat down by him and we talked for 20, 30 minutes. And some of his other family came in and, and it was great because as we sat there and talked, I didn't get a word in edgewise. Tim wanted to talk all kinds of sports with him and, and it was great. And I'm sitting there going, that's, that's one of my guys. That's, ooh, 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 that's one of my guys. I was so proud to meet him and so proud that Tim took the opportunity to get to know him. It was an interest, interesting few minutes that we chatted there and we talked about several things and we talked about why we were there and what we'd done that day and I finally got around to basketball and I told him that I'd been a fan for a long time and he looked at me and says, you're getting old. I'd been a fan of his for a long time, you're getting old. And I felt it at the time because I looked at him and I thought, he retired several years before. He was already gone. But he was right on target. You're getting old. When I look at the narrative that we read today, that CR read, about Paul's journey to Damascus, I'm reminded of several things that were prevalent to this situation that most of us know by heart, but some of us may not. But Paul began his passionate persecution of the church during this time. He had letters from the Jewish leaders to capture and even kill members of the way, the way being Christianity. His intentions may have been pure, but Paul, Saul at the time, was passionate about persecuting the Lord's church. And the first question of Saul to that voice there on that road to Damascus was, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus. See, Jesus confronted Saul on the road to Damascus. A light from heaven and a voice speaking to him. And Saul, what was Saul's question? Who are you? And he says, I am Jesus. We know that narrative. We know that situation. I don't know how we would have reacted. I don't know how it would have touched us in, in, in the ways, but I do know that as I look at this today and I realize how important this conversation is in the life of Saul, then I realize how blessed I am that it was asked. But the question is, is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And that's the question that the world is asking us to answer. And we have the answer. We have the ability to answer it. Who is Jesus? Well, let me start with this one. He is the, the promised Savior. He was prophesied about in Isaiah's prophecy, and that prophecy was fulfilled. But the first promise of a Savior came after the fall. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, this enmity, shall bruise your head. And you, Satan, shall bruise his heel. Well, who was this enmity? He was the one who would bruise the serpent's hair. He would be the one to redeem a sinful race of people. He's the one that we would need to look to, to be saved by. Other prophets added their uh, voices. Isaiah 7, 14, that the Savior would be virgin born. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then Isaiah 9 and verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders and shall in his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In Micah 5, 2, but you, O Bethlehem, of Phrathna, too small to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go out from me to be the ruler of Israel. 
And then in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for your God. What great statements that we have before us. But can you imagine how important the highway in the desert is when you stop and you think about it? It points us in the direction that we need to go. There's no winding. It's straight. Get, it, get through it. That's what he's wanting us to do. Get through that desert of life. Show us that happening in our lives. And we read about the miraculous birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. And the, the Roman Empire was a, a part of that miracle because they called for this taxation and this representation in their hometown to, to be part of the census so they could collect more money. But yet it worked out in God's favor. In Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, but when the set time had fully come, see, God was in charge. God sent his son. God knew when it was going to be. God made it happen. God allowed things to happen to bring about this coming of Jesus. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Yes, he was, he was the prophesied Savior. But not only that, he was the redeeming Savior. Jesus Christ, our Savior and redeemer we're saved by trusting in christ redeeming blood that was shed on the cross by putting our faith in the fact that his blood is necessary for us in our lives in mark 15 or mark 16 verses 15 and 16 he said to them go into all the world and preach the good news not the bad news not the okay news not the news of the day but the good news the gospel Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned. In Acts 2, verse 37, during the first sermon that was preached on the day of Pentecost by Peter and the other apostles, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? When they found out that they were guilty of sin, what do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, you can't miss that unless you want to. You can't make that say something else unless you want to make it say something else. In my old East Texas logic, which is just dumb good thinking, I think, it means what it says. And logically, it means that if we want to get rid of our sins, we need to be baptized and wash them away. Why would they change in midstream what God had planned from the very beginning when he said, I will bring my Redeemer, your Redeemer, to this earth? He'll take Satan out. How's he going to do it? He's going to redeem you. How's he going to do that? By washing away your sins. And how does he do that? We talked about it last week. We talked about it this week. He does it because we're immersed in water to be buried with him, to have our sins washed away. In Colossians 2, 8 through 15, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, changing what's logical. Isn't that what hollow and vain philosophy is? Changing that which is logical and true which depends on human tradition and the element, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought, uh, brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. John 1, 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Why are these important? Because every step Jesus took in his life was not only toward that cross, but toward us being redeemed. He came to do that. Isaiah had prophesied that painful death in Isaiah 53 at the hands of sinners. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God. Jesus revealed his coming death to his disciples in Matthew 20 and verse 18. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They knew who he was talking about. They will condemn him to death and, he will, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he'll be raised to life. And on the cross, 
he was the epitome of forgiveness where he said, again, I say to you, if, I'm sorry, Matthew 18, we go to that one first. In Matthew 18, and again, I say, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by the, my Father in heaven. For where two or more are gathered, or two or three are gathered in my name, there I am and amongst them. He is there with us. He is there all of the time. Where has he been? Where was he? He was on the cross. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there. What are the disciples teaching? That Jesus died on the cross. What is he teaching about him dying on the cross? That that's where we receive the blood of Jesus. That's where it came from. And what do we do? He says, you're immersed into that. You're baptized into him. And your sins are washed away. And what did Jesus do? How did he show us what that forgiveness was on the cross? He said, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminal. One criminal on one right, on right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. All, all, that's a big word, who come to Jesus can find forgiveness and eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that good news? That every person that comes can find eternal life and forgiveness of their sins. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In John 6 and verse 37, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away all who comes to Jesus can find forgiveness and can find eternal life and the fact that remains that he is the risen Savior that not only was he prophesied about not only is he for a forgiving Savior he's a promised Savior but here he is he is the Savior who has been risen he's redeemed us he is the one that will be there for us in that redemption. His resurrection proved his deity. In John 2 and 19, Jesus answered, tear down this temple and what? In three days I will build it again. Was he talking about the temple in Jerusalem? No. He was talking about his temple, him, himself. You tear me down and I'll be back. I'll be back. His enemies thought that he was going to, they would have the end of him at the cross. That when they nailed him to that tree, that, he, that would be the end of him. That we don't have to worry about him anymore. But three days later, he proved that to be wrong. Because three days later, see, I believe that my Jesus walked out of that grave. Don't you? Is that a belief that you have, that Jesus walked out? I mean, he took off the bandages that they had wrapped him in, the clothing that he had wrapped him in. He sat on the side of that bed. And I, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I would have been him, I would have said, just like I thought it'd be. And he stands up and he walks out. And, and, and what, what happens? He looks around and he takes a deep breath and he says, wow. Look, like, look what we've done. And then he sees Mary. And she's crying. She's upset. Why are you crying? I don't know where they put him. And then he calls her by name Mary. Can you imagine how she felt? Whoa. Yeah, and then she wants to reach out and grab me. She says, whoa, 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 don't touch me. I haven't ascended to my father. Wow. Tear down this temple in three days, I'll rise again. That's what he was telling them. Kill me. Put me in a grave. Three days later, I'm going to get up. And I'm going to walk out, and, 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 and you're going to wish I hadn't. Because he arose, we who trust him today have the same opportunity to know for sure, without a doubt, that one day we too are going to rise and we're going to walk into heaven. And I think probably most of us are going to go, wow, it's better than I thought. This is what it's all about.
in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Ah, there, there were a lot of proofs of his resurrection, the empty tomb, the eyewitnesses, the transformed disciples, the enduring church that has never gone away. Yes, he is a risen Savior. I don't serve a God that still has a tomb. I've got a friend of mine that's over in Israel right now, and they're, they're touring all of Jerusalem and all that area, and I've been enjoying reading his post, and today he, he laughingly said, and we're visiting the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and I said, ooh, I, wanted to, I almost said it. I almost said, oh, Jesus is too. No, Jesus had no tomb. Jesus was laid to rest in a borrowed tomb. And it's like my dad always says. He got out of there as quick as he could. But he had to take on the sins of the world. He had to have that separation. And yet when he walked out, wow, we did it. Was there ever any doubt? No, I don't think so. He knew there was going to be pain involved. Isn't that what he said on the, in the garden? Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But if not, my will, not my will, your will be done. So whenever he came up out of that grave and the pain was gone, the wounds not healed but no pain, when he looked and thought, I imagine whenever he put his feet on the floor, he praised God. Don't know that for sure, but I see the transformation that happens with us whenever we see someone who's, who comes to God for the first time and they answer that call to be immersed and to, to become a child of God. And whenever they come up out of that watery grave of baptism, to know in their heart that whatever they've done in the past is gone, that God doesn't remember it anymore. Oh, we will, but God doesn't. And Satan will try to remember it, remind us of it, but God doesn't. God doesn't remember it anymore. And many of them have said, wow, we did it. And that's only the beginning. It only starts there. It doesn't end there. It starts there. But not only is he a risen Savior, but he's going to return. Whenever he went up into heaven, his followers waited and told us to wait. For the followers will join him in his eternal life. We're going to walk into that place and we're going to not walk in and say, I just hope I, I hope I barely make it. If I can just barely make it inside the gate before they shut it, I'll be happy. Sure you will, but see, if you're a child of God, you're a child of the king. You get preferential treatment. You're going to bust the doors wide open. As a child of God, you can walk in with your head held up and say, I trusted in Jesus and he came through. Wow, look what he did. Look what we've done together. Is it easy? No. The return may not be easy. Christ, who died, will rise, who rose again, is going to come back. He's waiting. He must come to fulfill that promise. In John 14, in verses 1 through 3, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Are you ready? He was prophesied, promised to us, to this world. The predictions were there in the very beginning. He died to redeem you of your sins. He rose from the grave to give you the hope of eternal life so that we too may reenact his death, his burial, and his resurrection and be immersed for the forgiveness of our sins. And not only that, not only that, but one of these days he's coming back. The question is, is are you ready Are you ready? I am a name you wear 
Am I a name you wear or am I your Savior? Do you really just wear the name of Christian or do you really, really have him as your Savior? Is he your Savior? We're sharing the vision in 2016. The question is, is how are you doing? Many of us know what we need to do to be right with God. Many of us have done it. But there are so many who need yet to repent and confess Jesus' name, to begin their walk with God as his child, to be immersed for the forgiveness of our sins. There are many who need to do that this morning. Some of you here need to do that this morning. Some of you here this morning are like Saul who found out who Jesus was by trusting him and following him. You didn't know a whole lot about him when you started, but over the years you've learned who he is and what he's done for you. We are to be about sharing the vision. And I hope that you are seeing the importance of the mission of this church. I hope that you understand that faith in Jesus will either answer your questions about him as well as the questions others have about him or they won't depending on if you share that vision. The question is, is when he comes, will you ask, who are you, Lord? And what will be his reply? I know this. It'll be one of two answers. They both start the same. I am Jesus. Are you familiar with him? Do you know him? Are you ready to spend the rest of your life with him? If not, make your life right. Don't put it off. Be like Saul who said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. What do I do? Go to Jerusalem. Go to Damascus. Uh, It'll tell you, they'll tell you what to do. If you need help understanding what you need to do today, that's what we're here for. Our shepherds will pass among us. If there's a need that you have on a personal basis, visit with one of them. If you need to share something with the congregation, if you need to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, whatever your need publicly, come to the front. Let us help you. Let us serve you. Let us love on you. Let us have you as a part of our family. And if you need to come, do so now while we stand.